Good evening. So uh, yesterday, I was in the taxi coming back from the airport to my hotel here in Kansas City. And over the side of the road, I saw a huge train yard full of train, hundreds of train. They were full of coal. All the train were just coal. So we're still burning that stuff, you know. And as a matter of fact, this planet is using more and more and more energy, and most of the energy on the planet is achieved by burning fossil fuel. Now, this is starting to noticeably mess up the atmosphere and the ocean, and I think this is probably not such a good idea. So we need to find a new source of energy, ASAP. So over the last 10 years, we started working with different other sources, like alternative energy, the most uh, popular one being the wind and the sun. And uh, unfortunately, we find out that it's very hard to find something as practical and as cheap as burning dinosaur, rotten dinosaur. So, in my opinion, the best solution to all that is nuclear energy. Nuclear energy is very dense. You don't need huge surface to collect it. It's very solid. You know, it's reliable. You don't need to wait for the good weather to do it. And it actually can be cost effective. Now, we can do nuclear energy of two different ways. The first way is called fission. In fission, you take a big nucleus, usually uranium, you throw a neutron at it, it breaks in two, and it makes energy in a couple of other neutrons that go on to break more nucleus, like everybody knows that. This is the standard machine that makes the nuclear power plant that we have today. They're pretty good, but they have a couple of little issues uh, which have prevented the wide use of them. Now, the second way of doing nuclear energy is not very well known. Uh, for physicists, we know it, but most of people are not familiar with it, and it's fusion. Now, in fusion, what you do is you take two small nucleus, usually hydrogen, and you fuse them together, and it makes helium and a neutron, and it makes a lot of energy. Now, this is a lot better than fusion, uh, than fission. And uh, a nuclear power plant that would work with fusion will not make any uh, meltdown. It's impossible for melting down and it would produce only very short-lived waste. So there's not of the big problem that fission have. It would be absolutely awesome. Now, the fuel that uh, you need for fusion, you can extract it from the ocean. So you could extract the fuel from the ocean for one thousandth of a cent per kilowatt hour. Here in Kansas City, the price of electricity, I don't know what it is, but it's about like 10 cents per kilowatt hour or something. So one thousandth of a cent of a kilowatt hour. Very, very cheap fuel. And now, if the whole planet was run on fusion, there would be enough fuel in the ocean for two billion years. So there's enough fuel, and it's nice, and it's clean, and it's fantastic. Now, how come we don't have it? Like, if it's so great, why don't we have fusion power plant left, right, and center? Well, there's no such thing as a free lunch. Fusion is really, really hard. And the problem with fusion is those little hydrogen that you want to fuse together, they're both positively charged. Now, you might remember from your high school class that two positive charges repel each other. So they don't want to fuse. They want to bounce off like this. They don't want to go. In order to make them fuse, they have to have enough speed to go against their repulsion and then touch. Now, speed is the measure of a temperature. In a gas, the atoms are wiggling around, and the faster they go, the hotter it is. So the temperature required for fusion is 150 million degrees C. This is rather warm. So at that temperature, the collision are so violent that the atoms have electrons around it. The electrons go flying out one way, the ions go flying out the other way, and you get a big mess of high electron and ions swinging all over the place. And this is called a plasma. And controlling this superheated plasma is the big deal, and this is what has stumped fusion for quite a few years. Now, I got the fusion bug when I did my PhD in plasma physics in Vancouver at the University of British Columbia. And then after that, I needed a real job to make a bit of money. So I went in the printing industry, and I designed very large printer for the printing industry. So that was pretty good for 10 years. But after a while, I got a little bit bored. I was 40 years old. I had a bit of a middle-life crisis, you know. <laughs> what, what, what am I doing? What should I do in life? So I was looking at what I was doing, and I was doing printing so cheap that we could cut all the forests in Canada and bury you all under tons and tons of junk mail. So that was the fruit of my labor. So I find that not totally satisfactory. So I decided in place to single-handedly save the planet from global warming. <laughs> just, just that. <laughs> so this is an outrageously ambitious plan, but you only live once, so you, you know, go big or go home, you know? 
So, <laughs> so the first thing I did is I fill out the book and I look at all the different ways that people are doing fusion. So the physicists do fusion usually of two main uh, ways. So the first way they do fusion is with the magnetic field on a machine called a tokamak. You can drop that into party, you know a tokamak, sounds good. So you put a bunch of ring of big uh, superconducting magnets all around, and it makes a big sort of donut-shaped magnetic field. Now the plasma is electrically particle ch charged particle. They go around in a circle around the field line, and they go around and around in the donut, and they never touch the wall. So you can put all sort of heat in there, and it gets to 150 million degrees C, and it doesn't touch the wall because of the magnetic field, and then you can do fusion that way. So this here is the inside of one of those donuts. Uh, on the left, it's the machine itself. On the right, this sort of glowing purple color is the plasma itself. Now, there's a second way of doing it. You take a ping pong ball, you put your fusion fuel inside the ping pong ball, then you fill a stadium full of lasers, and then you fire all those lasers on this little pellet about yay big, and you squash it really, really hard. So when you compress something, it gets hot. If you compress it fast enough and hard enough, it can get fusion hot, and it makes the fusion. So, most people think that those physicists have been in their lab for 40 years and they're getting nowhere and fusion is not an happening thing, but that's not quite right. Because in actual fact, oh, this is a laser fusion machine, so you can see all the beam coming out to the center, and on the right, the little picture is the pellet that the beam are focused on. So this is the diagram of the fusion progress that we've done in the last 30 years or so. So in red dot is the fusion performance, and you can see that in 30 years, between 1970 and 2000, the performance of the fusion machine that those little nerdy physicists are working with went about 10,000 times. Now, this is actually the same growth rate as the number of transistors that we can put on a chip, which is the very famous Moore's Law. Now, everybody loves the Moore's Law. Everybody's in awe of the Moore's Law, and nobody knows at all about fusion. So I think that's not quite fair. <laughs> so this dot here is the jet. It's the joint operant torus. This is the picture I showed a bit earlier. This is in England. It's a big tokamak magnetic machine. In 1997, this machine produced 16 megawatt of fusion energy, but it requires 17 megawatt of heating to do that. So that's not quite there. But as you can see, we, we improved the fusion by 10,000, so we're almost there. We're pretty close to this sort of big square on the top that is enough to do energy. Now, this other point here is the NIF, the National Ignition Facility is a football field full of laser in uh, Livermore, California, and they fire on those little pellets. And about uh, five months ago, they announced that they managed to make more fusion energy than the fusion they managed to couple inside the little pellet. That's pretty good, but not quite good enough because the football field worth of laser was having way more energy than that because, you know, you lose at all stage. So the energy in the plasma was less than the energy. But they, they're doing good progress. Now, in the south of France, presently, they're building a very big machine called ITER. It's an international collaboration. There's about 10 countries that are working on that, including the US. And they're building a big donut, one of those tokamak machines. And this machine, when it comes online, will produce 500 megawatt of power with only 50 megawatt of heating. So this one will really make power. Now, fusion is often criticized as being too expensive. Yeah, it did cost, you know, a couple of billions every year to do this progress here. And that looks like a lot of money. But the amount of money spent to do the Moore's Law is way more. And at the end of the Moore's Law, what they managed to produce is this cell phone here. One trillion dollar worth of research to do this cell phone. And as far as I can tell, when I look at my kid playing with it, the only thing they do is they do some selfie. <laughs> and then they put that on the internet and text that to each other. So I'm not so sure that fusion is, is too expensive. Actually, I think fusion has been shortchanged. Considering we can fix our energy problem forever, for the next couple of billion years, I think it has been shortchanged. So I can say that, but I'm a little biased. You know, I started my own fusion company. <laughs> so, so when I decided to uh, start my fusion company in 2002, I knew that I couldn't compete with the big guy, like the big lab with the laser and the, the, and the magnetic fusion. That was too much money. And uh, those machines are pretty good. They're awesome, a beautiful piece of technology. They're all sort of high-tech gizmos in there. Every physicist are very excited, and they just love them. But as a power plant, they're not that great. They're way too complicated. They're way too expensive. And really, they don't have a really uh, good way of catching the energy. The energy of the fusion comes out as neutron, 
And those neutrons, when they hit the wall of the machine, it breaks the wall. So that's not very good. And also, you have to turn that into electricity somehow. So I decide, OK, I'm going to make fusion, but I'm not going to make it this way. I'm going to try to find a better way of making fusion. So I look into the literature, and I find quite a few different ways of doing fusion. And there's one, one method in particular that I found quite interesting, and it's magnetized target fusion, or MTF. Now, that was worked on a little bit in the 1970s. So in MTF, what we want to achieve is we have a big bucket full of liquid metal. And you spin the liquid metal like this, and it opens a big hole in the center, like a vortex, a bit like in toilet, you know? It goes And then in there, you put a lukewarm plasma, not too, too hot. And then you use steam to push on some piston, and you compress the plasma. And as you compress it, it gets even hotter. So it's a bit of a mix between the magnetic thing and the, pla the laser guy, but it's a bit slower. And I think it's much more practical. It saves a couple of big problems. The neutron can hit the wall, and uh, they, they don't hit the wall because they hit the liquid. And that, you can make steam with that thing and make some energy. So this was a very good solution, except it didn't work. Yeah, there's always a little, <laughs> little hick from there. So the problem. The problem was that when you compress it, it was a little too slow, and the plasma cooled down and evaporate before you have time to compress it. So I said, ah, we need to fix this, fix this solution. So I decided that we could do an impact. So if we do an impact, we accelerate the piston with the steam just before, but the bang, we hit another piston, and we all the energy gets down low very, very fast, and it compresses the plasma to fusion temperature. So I say, you know, calculate that, and I say, hey, this could, make, this could work, this could work. So I didn't wait too much, and I uh, rented this nice garage here, <laughs> which was near where I work. And I built a small machine about this big that produced a couple of fusion neutron. Not very much, but that was my marketing neutron. And with those marketing neutron, I managed to raise $50 million, and we hire 65 people. This is my crew here. And we are trying to make uh, big machines. So this is the machine we want to build. It's going to be a big three-meter bucket of liquid metal spinning around. And all those pistons are going to hit on the side and make the process MTF. And the neutron will be absorbed by the liquid metal, make some steam, make some turbine spin, and away you go. So we didn't only do a nice little video like that. We also started to make some hardware. So this is one of the big plasma injectors that inject the plasma in the center at the lukewarm temperature of 2 million degrees C. Still need to compress it to 150, though. So that's not quite the done deal. And this is a small tank, about one meter in diameter with 14 pistons. The real machine will be three meter with 200 pistons, so that's not quite, quite the done deal. So right now, we're building all those machines at, like, at scale. And in the next five years, we hope to manage to make this big machine all together and demonstrate that fusion will work. So most people think about fusion as the energy in the future. You know, the jet sun is going to roar on fusion. But actually, this is not quite true. Fusion is coming. And it's coming much sooner than we think. Like the big lab with their laser and the tokamak, they're almost there. They can almost make fusion. So now the thinking is a little changing. It's changing from can we do it to can we do it cost effectively. And there's a small bunch of little company like our company that are starting to look into that and joining the race to make fusion because we can all see that there's a big jackpot at the end. So somebody somewhere is going to crack that nut pretty soon. And with a bit of chance, it's going to be general fusion. Thank you.